This video has been sponsored by Squarespace. The dyeing of textiles has been done for thousands of years, but for most of this time, the dyes were from natural sources derived from things like plants, animals, insects, and minerals. It was only in the mid to late 1800s that synthetic organic dyes started to emerge. The first one was discovered accidentally in 1856 by William Henry Perkin when he was trying to make an anti-malarial drug. It was originally known as aniline purple or Perkin's mauve, but nowadays it's usually called movine. It turns out that movine's actually a mixture of molecules, but they all still have one similarity. They're all based around one fundamental subunit, which is a molecule known as aniline. This discovery led to the creation of a whole bunch of other aniline-based dyes, and it marked the beginning of the synthetic dye industry. Not too long after, a new class of dyes called azo dyes were discovered. They were still derived from aniline, but they had this characteristic nitrogen-nitrogen double bond known as an azo group. What's cool is that by changing the attachments on either side of the azo group, it's possible to generate a wide range of colors. This class of dye has now become one of the most popular. Most of them are used to color things like cotton, food, or paint, but some of them have some very specialized uses. For example, dyes are needed to make burnable CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays, and a lot of companies choose to use azo dyes. The laser in the burner shoots the disc and decomposes the dye in specific places. When it decomposes, it changes colors, and by alternating between changed and unchanged, it's possible to etch a binary message. Anyway, for this video, I've decided that it might be fun to make an azo dye and to color some clothing. In general, azo dyes are an extremely diverse family with many unique properties, but the majority of them are made and applied using the same process. This process is called azo coupling, and it was first done with the dye called Para Red, so I've decided to make that one. Now, in terms of ingredients, this is what I used. Both the P-nitroaniline and the sulfuric acid were made in previous videos. The other three ingredients were purchased online. So, to start things off, I get a beaker and I fill it with about 50 mils of distilled water. Then, I turn on the stirring and add a small amount of concentrated sulfuric acid. When it's all mixed in, I add 5 grams of the P-nitroaniline. Some of it's going to dissolve into solution, but most of it stays as a solid. At this point, the mixture is quite warm, and now I need to cool it. To do this, I set up an ice bath, add a thermometer, and wait for it to get to around 5C. When the reaction mixture finally hits the 5C mark, I start to slowly add a solution of sodium nitrite. Every time it's added, this mixture will heat up a little, and the P-nitroaniline will slowly disappear. So what I'm doing here is a reaction between the P-nitroaniline and the sodium nitrite in the presence of an acid to form a water-soluble diazonium salt. The sodium nitrite doesn't react directly though. It's first converted to the electrophilic nitrosonium ion by the sulfuric acid. The amine group of the P-nitroaniline then attacks it, a lot of electrons bounce around, and it leads to the formation of the final diazonium salt. The newly formed nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is not very stable though, and it'll start to degrade if the temperature rises too much. So because of this, it's very important to keep the reaction below 10 degrees Celsius. However, even below 10C, some degradation will probably still occur. If it does, it'll start to release nitrogen gas, which can sometimes cause a very small amount of bubbling or foaming. So the solution of diazonium salt is now ready, but we're not quite done yet. To make the dye, I need to couple it to something else, and in the case of para red, this other chemical is called 2-naphthol. I need to make a solution of this, and I start with about 100 milliliters of hot water. I add a small amount of the 2-naphthol, and then I slowly add sodium hydroxide solution until most of it dissolves. What I'm doing here is converting the normally insoluble 2-naphthol into a water-soluble sodium salt. Then to this solution, I add the material that I want to dye. 
I just went with a cotton ball and a piece I cut out from a sock. I thoroughly mixed them around and then I let them soak for about 5 to 10 minutes just to make sure that they pick up the naphthol. I can't let them sit here too long though or else the sodium hydroxide could start attacking the cellulose fibers. About 10 minutes later I remove them and I squeeze out the water. I then use some paper towel to dry them up as much as possible. The last thing to do is to make a dilute solution of the diazonium by adding about 5 milliliters of it to 25 milliliters of water. I dip my sock piece into it first and you can see a very nice red color immediately appears. Then on top of this I just throw in the cotton ball. I gently mix them around but then I let them sit there for several minutes just to make sure that the dye fully forms. What I'm doing here is known as an azo coupling reaction where the 2-naphthol attacks the diazonium salt to form the para red. The dye that forms is both within and on the surface of the cellulose fibers. The stuff on the inside is relatively permanent but the stuff on the outside is often easy to wash away or rub off. With azo dyes in general, this reaction is carried out using many different diazonium salts and coupling agents. Depending on this combination, we can get a lot of different colored dyes with quite variable sticking powers. Unfortunately, para red isn't the best. A lot of azo dyes do have the issue of rubbing off and washing away easily, and para red is particularly bad. There are a lot of other red azo dyes that do a better job and are used instead, although para red is still sometimes used. This is just the first washing, but I did several more until they stopped letting off any dye. Then I put them on a paper towel to dry. It looks like the piece of the sock is still a pretty decent red color, but that's just because it's still wet. As it slowly dries, it's going to lighten up a lot, and we'll see just how washed out it is. So fast forward a couple of days when it's completely dry, and the color is a lot closer to orange. I didn't try it, but I do wonder how much darker it would get if I put it through another dyeing cycle. Just for fun, it's also possible to draw out something using the naphthol solution, and then to pour the diazonium on top. Anyway, when it comes to dyeing clothing using azo dyes, this technique of forming the dye in the fiber itself is pretty much always used. The solid and pure form of the azo dye is still really useful in other industries though, for example to make things like paint. To convert the rest to pure para red, I again need to make a solution of the 2-naphthol. To do this, I mix 2.7 grams of 2-naphthol with 50 milliliters of dilute sodium hydroxide. I stir it until everything dissolves, then I put it in the freezer and chill it to about 0 C. I transfer the diazonium solution to a larger beaker, and then I start to add the cold naphthol mixture. As it cooled, a lot of sodium naphthalate precipitated, but this really shouldn't be a problem. Some small bits might get trapped in some clusters of para red particles, but I can't imagine it's going to be a whole lot. In any case, the reaction here is pretty much the same as before, where the 2 naphthol attacks the diazonium salt. However, there is one small difference, and we don't immediately form para red here. The naphthol mixture is very basic, and it's more than enough to neutralize all of the acid in the diazonium solution. Under these conditions, a lot of it is still in its salted form. So to generate the final para red, I need to acidify it. I slowly add dilute sulfuric acid with a lot of mixing in between, and the color lightens up a little. In terms of its texture, it also becomes a lot less pasty. Once it got to a pH of around 1 or 2, I add a little bit more water to try to thin it out, and then I move on to filtering. The para red is washed several times with distilled water, and then it's transferred to a watch glass to dry. I leave it out for a few days, and I'm left with a nice and crispy red powder. For this video though, I won't be using it to make paint or anything. I've decided to start a series on dyes and pigments, so I'm going to wait until I have a lot of different colors before I start making paint. I did want to try the dyeing process again though, except on a larger scale and with a slight twist. I wanted to see if it were possible to develop the dye everywhere except in certain spots. 
Ideally, I'd like to have Nile Red appear as it's being dipped in. Originally, I was thinking of doing it with t-shirts, but I ended up using socks because they're small and a lot easier to manage. Anyway, to get things working, I figured I had two things I could try, either white spray paint or water repellent spray. From this point on, keep in mind that this is the first time I'm ever doing anything like this, so my technique is going to be far from perfect. I cut out a Nile Red stencil, and then I got to spraying. For the first two, I just used spray paint, but I used a lot more on the second one. For the third one, I just used the water repellent. I kind of messed up here because I used way too much spray in one run, when I should have done a few separate coats. All the letters kind of melted into each other, but I didn't notice until later on. The fourth and fifth ones used a combination of the paint and the spray, except the fifth one had a lot more of each. To make it so I had a total of three pairs, I included one last sock, but I didn't do anything to it. After spraying all of them, I let them dry for about a day, and then I got started with the dyeing process. I remade the diazonium solution on about a 6x scale, and I soaked the socks in a 2-naphthol solution. After soaking for several minutes, each was taken out and thoroughly dried by squeezing them in paper towels. The freshly prepared diazonium solution is then diluted with some ice cold water, and now it's time to get things going. I started with sock number 5, because I figured it would be the one with the best results. I go ahead and dip it in, and I was really surprised how well it worked. As usual, I let it soak there for a few minutes, and then I remove it and squeeze out the water. The next one that I did was number 4, and it worked pretty much just as well, it was just a lot harder to see. Sock number 3 was a pretty big mess, and with the repellent alone, it doesn't look like much or anything happens. Things are getting murkier now though, so for sock number 1 and 2, they were a lot harder to see. The final sock that I put in was sock number 6, which didn't have anything done to it, so it wasn't too interesting. So now that it's done, I pour in the naphthol solution, and I isolate the para red just like earlier in the video. This time, things did get a little messier though. All the socks were thoroughly washed until they stopped bleeding. This isn't standard practice though, and most textile producers only wash it once or something, just to get off any unreacted chemicals. I'm not really sure why socks 4 and 5 are a lot lighter than the rest, but whatever. I throw them all in a drying rack, and I wait for a few days. As we saw before, now that they're dry, they've all lightened up quite a bit. As I said earlier, this is because para red doesn't have amazing sticking power, so most of it was washed away. It also looks like the writing has darkened a little. However, I'm not sure if they actually have, or if they just look like this because the socks are so much lighter. My goal from the beginning was to have the letters appear as it was being dyed, so I think it was a success. I was well aware though that the socks in the end wouldn't be the nicest. In any case, I figured I'd try to fix them up a little, so I bought some black and red spray paint that's specifically meant for clothing. I use the template again, and I just go over each sock. I do a few applications, and then I let them dry for a couple days. The final results were honestly pretty bad. I started with sock 1 and made my way to the 6th one, and on the way, I think I got better and better. I messed up the 5th one though, because I moved it when the black paint was still a bit wet. In any case, I now have 6 Nile Red socks that are extremely variable in quality. Because I'm selfish, I'm going to be keeping the nicest ones, which are socks 4 and 5, but I think I'm going to be giving the other two pairs away. I mean, this is completely assuming that anyone would even want them. So, considering these prizes are pretty terrible, I'm also going to throw in a 4-piece beaker set to each of the winners. To enter for a chance to win, you just need to follow me on YouTube or Twitter, or visit my Instagram. The link for the contest will be in the description. The winners will be chosen next week at random, and I'll contact them directly. 
I'll also ship the socks anywhere in the world, completely free of charge, so you don't have to worry about anything. Anyway, that's about it for this project. As I mentioned earlier though, I do plan to make a lot more dyes and pigments, and the next one is probably going to be indigo. I also might come back and revisit Azo dyes at some point, and make some other ones that are better than para red. So, as you saw at the beginning, Squarespace has been nice enough to sponsor this video. If you want to make your own website and support my channel at the same time, you can sign up for a free trial using my special link, squarespace.com slash nilred. On top of a free trial, this link will also give you a nice 10% off your first purchase. Anyway, with that being said, several months ago, way before any sponsorship, I actually made my website using Squarespace. Originally, it was only made to serve one purpose, which was as a place to sell my merchandise. Because of this, the page was really basic, and besides the shop, there wasn't much else on it. However, now that Squarespace is sponsoring some of my videos, I'm actually able to dedicate some time to fixing it up and adding more content to it. The first thing that I wanted to do was change the layout that I was using, because it was very basic. Squarespace has a lot of templates to choose from, so it took me 10 or 20 minutes to find the one that I liked. After that though, it was really quick to change it over. I also updated all the website information and added a cool banner video to the homepage. What's really nice about all of this is that it's easy to do and it doesn't require any coding or anything, it's all very intuitive. Another major change is that I decided to add a blog tab at the top, which I'll occasionally update with some short articles. I feel like it's a good place for me to answer some commonly asked questions, and I started it off with two articles. The first is where I talk about how to get started with your own experimenting at home, and the second is answering where I get all my chemicals and glassware. I've also added a project page where I'll list all the videos that I'm currently working on or editing. Anyway, with that being said, Squarespace is genuinely a very good and affordable service. And, as I mentioned earlier, they're offering all my viewers a free trial and 10% off their first purchase. If you want to support my channel, you should definitely sign up and give it a try using my personalized link, which again is squarespace.com slash nilred. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post it to YouTube, and they can also directly message me. All supporters with $5 or more will get their name at the end of the video like you see here.